make sure that this is on. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, excellent. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's nice to see so many people here. Uh, very, very nice. I am Chris Rex, the Vice President of Free Thought Fort Wayne, people who sponsored this very nice event tonight. As an introduction, I'm going to take a minute to share with you who we are and what we are about. Our group was founded in late 2014, and we are an active chapter of the American Humanist Association. As humanists, we believe in a progressive, <clears throat> a progressive philosophy of life that without theism or other supernatural beliefs, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good of humanity. Needless to say, we actually try to stay involved with the community. And as part of that goal of community outreach, we provide services like this debate, as well as talks on a variety of topics. Twice a year, we also provide gift bags of necessities to the homeless in our community, and we have offered free haircuts to the homeless as well. In addition, we volunteer our services at our local community harvest food bank and have an ongoing food drive to collect non-perishable food for the food bank. Many of our members are activists in the community advocating for social justice, equality, science education, and environmental issues such as clean air, water, and soil. Our next public event will be the showing of the acclaimed film, The Occupation of the American Mind, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the U.S. media culture. It will be shown on May 16th at 7 p.m. at the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House at 5310 Old Mill Road. The event will be free and open to the public. It will be co-sponsored by the Hoosier Unitarian Universalist for Justice in the Middle East, the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, and of course, Free Thought Fort Wayne. Flyers for this event can be found on the Free Thought Fort Wayne table uh, just outside the auditorium here. They kind of look something like this. So if you're interested, uh, please pick up a flyer. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. No food or drinks are allowed in the auditorium. Also, restrooms are located at the back of the lobby, uh, just outside the auditorium here and to your left. Also, of course, please silence your cell phones. Um, definitely don't want uh, our guests being interrupted. <clears throat> Speaking of, what we have tonight is a debate. A debate on a highly controversial kind of thing. That said, have to keep in mind that such things can generate high emotions and that that's not what we're here to do. We're here to try to generate intelligent thought and conversation and use some critical thinking along the way with any luck. So I ask that we be courteous um, and respectful of one another. And if it comes to a point where we allow questions uh, from the audience, I do ask that you be considerate in that regard as well. So with that, um, I would like to introduce our moderator for the night, Mr. Roger McNett. He is a Free Thought Fort Wayne member. He also has a bachelor's degree from Manchester University and a master's degree from Ball State. He is a former educator in East Allen County Schools and was an area governor of Toastmasters International. He is also the past president of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fort Wayne, where that previous event that I just mentioned is taking place at, and is currently the president of a PFLAG um, Fort Wayne group that broadens, uh, broadens family and understanding of their LGBT youth, and he speaks to many organizations and universities on that topic. I will go ahead and introduce Roger up here so he can introduce the two speakers that you're actually here to listen to. Up there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. I'm Roger. I, I, I normally will be down there, but we wanted to start up here with something special. There's a reason for it, but I think you will understand when I'm done. 
We are very fortunate to live in a country that has a wide diversity of beliefs because the First Amendment of our great Constitution prohibits the establishment of a national religion. That amendment has a lot to do with why we are here tonight. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the rights of the people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government to redress grievances. And we are here peacefully. This is a great democratic society. We can exist. Let me do that again. In this great democratic society, we can exist in better harmony when we are aware of and respect the diversity of beliefs or non-belief of those around us. It is natural for us to feel that what we believe is the true or best way to believe. And most of us do. But we rise to a higher level of civil and of, of civility by allowing others to have different beliefs. And when we are respectful of the other person's right to discover his or her unique beliefs. One result can be that for most of us, kindness allows us to better appreciate others. Not because of their belief, but because of their behavior, which is often formed by their belief. Okay. I thought that was important to share. So I did. The debate will be split into two we split into 60 minutes by statements from the speakers and 30 minutes of question and answers to cards that you fill out. When you, when you fill out your card to ask a question, please ask it and tell which speaker you want to answer your questions. You won't know that until after they've talked. Um, so address your cards to Dr. James Spiegel or to that's here or to John Loftus that's over there. If you can't remember the whole names, it's James or John. <laughs> okay. Our first speaker will be first speaker will be Dr. James Spiegel. So that right? Good for me. He, he is a professor of philosophy and religion at Taylor University. He has published over 80 articles and book chapters and several books on ethics and religious philosophy, including Idealism and Christian Philosophy, The Making of an Atheist, The Love of Wisdom, and many more. The second speaker will be John Loftus. He is a Fort Wayne Free Thought member and a leading atheist writer and thinker. He is a former evangelical minister and Christian apologist. Having been a teacher at several Christian colleges teaching philosophy and critical thinking and ex ethics. He has written seven books and co-authored co -authored three others on the subject of atheism, including The End of Christianity, God or Godless, The Outsider, and many, many more. So, are you ready? Yes. yes. I am too. Okay. 
Our debate begin with 15 minute position statements from each speaker. We will start with Dr. James Spiegel, who will speak for this 15 minutes, and then John Loftus for a total of 30 minutes. We'll do more things after that, but we'll talk about it. Let's get started and have our speakers share their faith and understanding. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, welcome everybody and thank you for those uh, introductory comments. And I want to thank the uh, Allen County Public Library for hosting this event and for the uh, folks at Free Thought Fort Wayne for making these arrangements and organizing everything. Uh, and thanks to my debate partner, John Loftus, for his willingness to have this debate. <clears throat> this is our second debate and it's many nights, so we've done a double header here. It's, it's, uh, it's been good to get to know John. So let's begin. The question before us tonight is whether religious faith is rational. My position is that, yes, religious faith is rational, given certain conditions, specifically having to do with the content of one's beliefs and how one's religious beliefs are formed. I do think there are plenty of irrational religious beliefs, but theistic belief is rarely irrational. Particular beliefs about certain religious doctrines may be irrational, but belief in God, a higher spiritual power or mind behind the universe who cares for creation and is at work in human history, belief in such a being is nearly always rational. I will launch our discussion by defining some key terms, then I will summarize major categories of evidence for theism, and later I will note other grounds for belief in God. So to begin with some definitions of, of key terms. What does it mean to be religious? Generally, I follow religious study scholar Ninian Smart's definition of religion, which identifies seven different dimensions of religious practice. For our purposes, we need only focus on two central factors that he identifies, and those are the historical and philosophical dimensions of religion. Since, generally speaking, it is these dimensions which entail the other aspects of religiosity, including ritual, ex the experiential, the institutional, ethical, and sacred material dimensions of religion. The sort of religious faith I am most interested in is theistic, and more particularly Christian theism. I will have much to say about theism generally and Christianity specifically. So what is faith? This is a contentious question within theistic communities, including the Christian tradition. Some Christians from Tertullian to Kierkegaard have endorsed fideism, which is the view that faith and reason inherently conflict. On the opposite extreme are rationalistic conceptions of faith, including the approaches of Thomas Aquinas and Rene Descartes, who confidently assert that God's existence and many divine attributes are straightforwardly demonstrable. My own approach is moderate relative to these two extremes. It's neither fideistic nor rationalistic. I regard genuine religious faith as including a volitional component, while intellectual assent to a set of beliefs is a standard element of faith. The other key component is personal trust. That's the volitional aspect. Personal trust in the form of a commitment to abide by the ethical teachings of one's religious tradition. So then, Christian faith would entail certain beliefs about Jesus of Nazareth, as well as a serious continuing resolve to live according to his teachings. Finally, what do I mean by rational? Here again, there is much debate among philosophers and other scholars, but my general view is in step with mainstream opinion. I distinguish between negative and positive requirements for a belief to be rational. The negative requirement is that in holding a belief, one must not violate any intellectual duties, the sorts of duties that include logical consistency, conceptual coherence, 
fit with known facts, intellectual humility, intellectual diligence, and so on. Positively, a rational belief is one which has epistemic grounds, such as evidential warrant, personal experience, trustworthy authority, or explanatory power. So my position is that depending on a given person's other belief commitments, any major theistic religious belief, or even a generic non-religious theism, can be rationally affirmed, as well as any of a variety of Christian forms of theism. Now, I believe that theism generally, and Christian theism specifically, are logically consistent, conceptually coherent, and fit the known facts from science, history, and ethics. Here is a quick summary of some major categories of evidence for God. Note that most of these evidences come from science, a fact that will be important to bear in mind should John press the misguided point that somehow religious faith contradicts science. First, the cosmological evidence. The fact that there is a cosmos at all needs an explanation, and theism provides a satisfactory explanation. The basic inference of the cosmological argument is this. Anything which begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist about 14 billion years ago, according to current cosmological estimates. So, the universe has the cause. This confirms the theistic doctrine of God as the all-powerful cause of the cosmos. Second, cosmic fine-tuning. The universe features numerous physical constants or laws of nature, each of which had to be precisely set within the narrowest parameters in order for the universe to permit life. The Big Bang expansion rate, the strong and weak nuclear forces, the gravitational constant, and numerous other laws. These all had to converge perfectly for life in this universe even to be possible. <clears throat> Imagine a radio dial that is trillions of light years long. And there's only one station on that dial, call it the life station, that is a millimeter wide. Well, we are, we are tuned right in to that station. And this confirms the theistic idea that God is an infinitely intelligent and wise designer of the cosmos. Third, the emergence of life from non-life. Given the existence of a universe <clears throat> and one that is appropriately fine-tuned for life, this in no way guarantees that life will emerge. In fact, the odds of life, even given these conditions, are vanishingly small. How does brute matter come to life? How do inert substances become so intricately and functionally arranged so as to produce metabolizing and self-replicating cells? In the early 1980s, scientists Fred Hoyle and Chandra Wickramasinghe calculated that the odds of such a living system forming naturally are 1 in 10 to the 40,000th. So that's a 10 followed by 40,000 zeros. That's an incom incomprehensibly large number to give you a little bit of perspective. The number of particles in the known universe is estimated to be about 10 to the 80th. So when I say 10 to the 40,000th, we're talking about a number that's beyond human comprehension. <coughs> Those are the odds, 1 in 10 to the 40,000th. According to Hoyle and Wick Ramasinghe, uh, against life forming spontaneously <clears throat> in our universe. Even many atheistic scholars are now admitting that Darwinistic naturalism fails to account for this. Hence the subtitle of atheist Thomas Nagel's recent book, Mind and Cosmos. His, his subtitle, and this is an atheist uh, speaking here, his subtitle is Why the materialist, neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. Fourth, there is the emergence of consciousness. A further problem for naturalism is the fact that there are conscious beings in the universe, we humans and lots of animals besides. 
Cognitive scientists and <clears throat> philosophers of mind have been trying to explain this for decades, and every naturalistic paradigm has reached a dead end. Philosophical behaviorism, functionalism, um, reductive materialism, all have failed to even begin to explain the essence of consciousness, much less its origin. The essence of consciousness, as we understand it, <clears throat> and as uh, most philosophers of, of mind would put it, is first-person subjectivity. Now, even granting that the cosmos could emerge on its own, be perfectly fine-tuned for life, and that a living, self-replicating cell could spontaneously emerge and lead to eons of upward evolutionary development, the question arises, why consciousness? And how consciousness? This is utterly inexplicable on a naturalistic worldview. <clears throat> so these are four major problems for naturalism, which are readily explained <clears throat> by theism. The existence of the cosmos, the fine-tuning of the cosmos, the emergence of life, and the emergence of consciousness. Together, these facts were powerful enough to persuade the longtime atheist philosopher Antony Flew to finally admit that God exists. Flew was regarded one of the greatest scholars from Britain in the 20th century. For 50 years, he maintained his atheistic convictions. But in about 2005, he came out as a theist, and that rocked the world that made international news, and it was because of these considerations that I've just itemized. So if Anthony Flew has finally uh, if he finally admitted that God exists, perhaps uh, John Loftus will be next and we'll be reading about that in the papers and getting reports on that. I bet it would at least make local news, <coughs> if not national news. But there is another important category of evidence for God that I should mention, and that is the whole realm of morality. Most people, hopefully including John Loftus, believe in objective moral norms. That is, there is a way that all people ought to behave. That is, with kindness, <clears throat> generosity, respect, love, and other virtues. And there are ways that we ought not to behave, such as unkindly, dishonestly, and abusive. But how, on a naturalistic worldview, do we account for such norms? Moral oughts or obligations are not the sorts of things that can be found in the physical world. Values are transcendent and thus demand a transcendent cause. And here again, we have a significant category which defies naturalism, but is easily explained by theism. What all of this suggests is that theism has unmatched explanatory power in five of the most important subject areas of human inquiry. The existence and order of the cosmos, the origin of life, the origin of consciousness, and the reality of moral truth. So the religious person is warranted in their belief in God. And given that these facts imply that this being is all powerful, all wise, and all good, the believer is also warranted to trust God. And those two things together, we will recall, constitute the essence of religious faith, which is to say that religious faith is rational. Note that naturalism explains none of these facts, while theism explains all of them. I have not previewed the remarks that John Loftus has prepared for tonight, though I think I have a hunch where he might go, seeing as we debated last night to see how much he's changed. But I do predict that he will not offer a, a substantive explanation for any of these things. Keep this in mind as he speaks. Thank you.
the people who put this together and being able to be here at the, the library. Especially, uh, I'm indebted to Professor Jim, who has agreed to try defending what cannot be reasonably defended. So, uh, <laughs> I tried last night, I'm sure he'll try tonight, just about say. Uh, Jim, I'm going to ask uh, the people here to do something as I did last uh, night, and I'd prefer if you didn't respond just yet. Uh, if you're a believer here tonight, um, and uh, I'd like to have you raise your hands, if you feel certain or nearly certain your religious faith is correct, that is, you have little or no doubt uh, that your faith is true. Raise your hand, I'd like to see your hands if you, if you, or like if you would identify with that. Now, at the church, thank you, that's, uh, you know, I have to think that maybe uh, the people who didn't raise their hands uh, could possibly be um, um, you know, not religious to some degree. At the um, church that we were at last night, boy, I saw hands everywhere. I knew, I knew you wouldn't respond that way. I just knew you wouldn't. Um, my goal is to show that you have a false, unreasonable, misplaced sense of certainty, which is a byproduct of your faith. If I can show you, if I can show that, then I've shown your faith is unreasonable. Would you win? Would you concede a win for me tonight if I did do that? Um, I had to do more than that, but I had to at least do that. You realize, don't you, that you're, you all cannot be right about your religious faith. You don't know each other. How do you know you have the same faith? Uh, you much less certain about it. Not all of you have had the same exact faith, and um, so you can't be at all certain of it. I mean, how, how could that produce certainty the faith that you have? Um, most all of you have adopted the religious faith of your parents to a great degree. Um, coming from a long line of Irish Catholics, I know what that's like. I was raised a Catholic. Uh, can you be certain you were raised by the right parents who just happened to have the correct religious faith? You could have been raised by uh, different parents. Religious faiths are almost always products of when and where you were born or by the parents who indoctrinated you to believe. Uh, as, as this happened to you, it happened to your parents before you and their parents and their parents before them, just like it happened to my parents before me. By definition, faith is always about that which has low probabilities. Uh, actions based on faith are risky, are they not? And yet faith produces such certainty, it's uh, quite amazing. And it, can't, and it can't be based on much if that's what it does. Um, the fact is you cannot claim to believe what you do with certainty. Otherwise, why not say you know it rather than that you believe it? Surely you know lots of things that have a greater degree of probability than that, most notably that you are here experiencing the sights and sounds of this room tonight. The certainty you claim to have is like pretending what's not true. It's a clear indication you need to rethink your religious faith. Neurologist Robert Burton explains this misplaced sense of certainty in this way, quote, Despite how certainty feels, it is neither a conscious choice nor even a thought process. The sense of certainty arises out of involuntary brain mechanisms that, like love or anger, function independently of reason. Burton says, quote, The feeling of certainty should be thought of as one of our emotions, just like anger or pleasure or fear. This feeling is unrelated to the strength of the evidence of what we believe. This feeling of certainty can be extremely powerful, so much so that it wins despite contrary evidence that should mitigate it. Not only this, but our brains are very good at making up reasons to justify this feeling of certainty rather than following the evidence to the reasonable conclusion." Unquote. Dr. Jonas Kaplan is an assistant research professor of psychology at the University of Southern California. He and his research team studied the brain scans of people while they were being challenged about their political beliefs. The study uncovered a correlation. When a belief is directly challenged by new information, the brain kicks in into defensive mode exactly as if it was being physically threatened. Kaplan, quote, the brain can be thought of as a very sophisticated self-defense machine. If there is a belief that the brain considers part of who we are, it turns on its self-defense mode to protect that belief, unquote. Listen to this following statement. I'm an atheist. And I'm here to convince you there isn't a God. Did you feel that? Did you feel a little discomfort? That's your brain. You went into defensive mode. Now, 
how can you, I hope to honestly investigate this question of whether a God exists or not if your brain won't let you. Author Guy Harrison put the problem this way. When someone challenges an important belief, quote, the brain is likely to instinctively go into siege mode. The drawbridge is raised, the crocodiles are released into the moat, and defenders ban the walls. He goes on to say, quote, the worst part of all this is that the believer usually doesn't recognize how biased and close-minded he is. He likely feels he is completely rational and fair. Billionaire stock investor extraordinaire Warren Buffett tells us, quote, what the human being is best at doing is interpreting all new information so that their prior conclusions remain intact, unquote. Now, if this applies to political beliefs and investing, investing in the stock market, how much more so does it apply to one's religious faith? Most people identify with their faith so much so it defines who they are. And that kind of belief will be defended by the brain more than all others. The job of the evolved human brain is not primarily to get at the truth. Its primary job is to protect us from harm by keeping us in a socially acceptable, caring, tribal grouping with whom we feel support and can turn to it and, uh, for help in times of need. This means the brain makes us comfort uh, to conform to our own tribe's views. Nonconformists could be kicked out of the tribe, and that was dangerous. So the biggest barrier to honestly desiring the truth about religious faith is our tribal grouping. You want to know the truth? You may have to love truth more than you love your own tribe. Now most people can't do that. Most people don't value truth enough for that. I, I know a woman I wanted to ask her, I mean I asked her if she would um, want to consider whether her faith was false. She said, no, I don't. And I'm happy. And that's that. Because she knew the social reper repercussions might, might be if she decided that her faith was false. There are social repercussions, and she can't. And she identified, and she identifies with her face, so she would have to give up her identity. At least that's what's in the mind, and it's going through the mind now, in some of their minds. Hmm. In any case, we know the human brain doesn't function quite properly, and we know the solution. The first step is to acknowledge the problem, just like Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, you have to get a problem. Until you recognize you've got a problem, there's no in, in desire to, to solve it. The problem is that the evolved brain won't allow us to seriously entertain facts that disrupt our personal, social, and tribal comfort zone, so it will do everything it can to reject them. Step two is to resolve to disarm the brain. The rational side of the brain should take over and reject what the irrational reptilian side of our brain wants. It should demand sufficient objective evidence, scientific evidence if possible, for what will be accepted as true. You should do this as outsiders would, as much as possible, by applying the same objective standards to your own religious sect as you do to the many other religious sects that you reject. You should require the same kind of evidence as you require of an ancient Chinese religion if it made a claim about a virgin birth to a, uh, of an incarnate God. Think about what that would require. Or you believe that. If you're a Christian, treat your faith as if you're a non-Christian, and if you're a Muslim, treat your faith as if you're a non-Muslim, and so forth. Hypothetically, become a non-believer. See what it looks like to someone who does not believe, like an atheist. For if it doesn't convince non-believers, it won't convince anyone else either. When I did this, I saw that my faith was unreasonable. Now here are some examples of what I mean. Do you really believe the Bible without any objective evidence when it says the earth existed before the sun, moon, and the stars, which are created on the fourth day? Do you really have any objective evidence that a snake or a talking dog talked, or that an axe head floated? What about a sun standing still in the sky, or backing up, or turning red as blood, or blackening out for three hours? Is there any objective evidence that a star led three astrologers to a manger in Bethlehem and hovered over it? What actual evidence is there that a virgin conceived of an incarnate son of God? Oh, they claim that. But religious people make all sorts of claims. Where's the evidence for it? What about Jesus levitating with two dead men in front of the disciples that are soaring up into the sky? What about the claim that a 
dead people arose from the grave when Jesus died, waited in their tombs for three days, and then appeared in Jerusalem along with Jesus on Easter Sunday. So the text says happened. What about the claims that shadows, clothing, pools, and handkerchiefs healed people? Religious faith cults make these claims all the time. You don't believe them because you weren't raised to believe them. You only have to be an objective evidence of those faith cults you were not uh, raised to believe. René Descartes considered father of modern philosophy. He said, quote, if you would be a real seeker after truth, it is necessary, at least in, for once in your life, you doubt as far as possible all things, unquote. Comparatively speaking, believers should not do this, ever. It should be a right of passage in the adulthood. When challenged, like I'm doing now, their brains will con convince them that reading books by authors who defend their own religious sex is doing all that's required. But doing this is seeking to confirm what you already believe. It's like Mormons being defenses of Mormonism or Muslims being defenses of Muslims. This if you aren't reading books outside your comfort zone, you're not really searching for the truth. You are actually scared of the truth. And the brain is making you scared of the truth. Or the brain is making you so convinced that you're right that you don't think about or care about reading anything else. Now, don't pat yourself on the back too much for being here tonight. Uh, some of you aren't here really to learn from me. Some of you, anyway. Some of you are here to learn him to demolish me. <laughs> Say it in so. It wasn't the truth last night, I'll tell you that. So is religious faith reasonable? No, the answer can be found in the definitions of the terms themselves. <clears throat> to be religious is to accept the claim that there is a superhuman deity, most notably a personal creator God, who is to be worshipped and obeyed. Two, to be reasonable is to follow the rules of logic and to require some sufficient objective evidence for knowledge of things about the world we live in, including the religious claim that a personal creator God exists. To have faith is to accept the claim based on flawed reasoning and insufficient objective evidence. For our purposes, it's to accept the miraculous claim, such as the virgin giving birth to an incarnate son of God, without sufficient objective verifiable evidence. It's to allow the reptilian brain to keep us away from honestly seeking the truth by a number of cognitive biases, most notably confirmation biases, which seeks, above all, to confirm what one already believes, rather than to confirm it. St. Anselm's motto is a prime example of why faith is folly. He said, faith seeks understanding. First there is faith, then believers seek to understand it by making the necessary distinctions that make it palatable, and by coming up with arguments and desperately searching for any evidence showing it's true. This is the core of what confirmation bias is all about, and by following Anselm's model, Christian defenders can and do avoid any and all evidence to the contrary. Anything based on faith, no matter how ludicrous, can be made to be consistent by the available evidence, said Professor of Philosophy Stephen Law. Therefore, putting the definitions together to have religious faith is to accept the religious claim that there is a superhuman deity, most notably a personal creator, who is to be worshipped and obeyed based on flawed reasoning and insufficient sufficient, uh, evidence. Now, this is not just a semantic issue, this is uh, the core of our debate. Uh, Jim's wrong. If faith is trust, there is no reason to trust faith. If we are to trust in God, we need to have sufficient objective evidence to know that she exists and that she can be trusted. What I'm doing here is I'm arguing along with atheist author George Smith that, quote, faith as an alleged method of acquiring knowledge is totally invalid, unquote. It's not just the religious dogmas that are unreasonable, it's how they are arrived at and maintained. For as Peter Bogosian has argued, quote, belief in God is not the problem. Belief without evidence is the problem. Warrantless, dogged confidence in the problem. And to close, he adds, the most charitable thing we can say about faith is that it's likely to be false. Thank you. Because I didn't before, because I knew you just wanted to get listening to these folks. Um, now there will be four five-minute alternating replies to the other. And there will be two by each speaker, five minutes, two, that means it'll take 
20 minutes. So, enjoy the 20 minutes of responding to the other. Thank you. There's a lot to address there, so I'll get right into it. Uh, John emphasized in his remarks uh, that there are certain sociological factors that presumably explain all the things we believe as religious folks. Um, this is really uh, a distraction, uh, as is evident in the fact that it, it can be applied to other contexts as well. Uh, people born and raised in New York City are more likely to believe in Darwinism than those raised in Lubbock, Texas. <clears throat> but how is that relevant to the, the truth of that theory? Um, he also goes on to uh, apply what he calls the outsider test for religious belief. He says uh, in one of his books that one's own religious faith well, this is not an exact quote, that, but you should proceed with your religious faith with a presumption of skepticism and test your beliefs as if you were an outsider to your faith. <clears throat> that test itself applies just as well to the atheist or the agnostic, right? She should be willing to approach the issues dispassionately and as objectively as possible. Why should we think that religious people are any more dogmatically entrenched in their worldviews than secularists or atheists. Uh, in defending the outsider test, Loftus emphasizes dogma reinforcing cultural context, but he ignores another major factor, which is dogma reinforcing moral and psychological factors. Um, maybe he touches on that, but there's a lot more to be said. Uh, I have said a lot more on that in my book, The Making of an Atheist. One's moral and psychological dispositions are as likely as sociological factors to incline one for or against the religious. In any case, we must all be wary of how we are prone to bias and warped perceptions on ultimate life issues. But there is a better standard than Loftus's outsider test, I believe, and that better standard is procedural fairness and open-mindedness when reviewing evidence. One can achieve this without indulging full-fledged skepticism. So here we see that John is guilty of a false dichotomy. Dogmatism, skepticism, it was the same mistake that Sextus Empiricus made 1800 years ago. One can have convictions while still fairly and open-mindedly considering evidence for and against one's worldview, whether one's religious or not. Uh, he also spent some time debunking certain uh, miracle claims and his assumption there wasn't explicit in his comments just now, perhaps, but his assumption is that, you know, these things need to be scientifically demonstrable. But you know what? Not all evidence is scientific. Uh, there, are, there are also historical evidences and other categories of evidence having to do with um, uh, other fields besides science and history, uh, theological evidence and philosophical evidence. And then I would note in conclusion uh, that science itself makes a number of assumptions that can only be called faith commitments. Okay? The, the topic that we're discussing tonight is whether religious faith is rational. Uh, John is opposed to any kind of faith, but we all have faith commitments. And you might want to call them philosophical articles of faith, but they are faith commitments nonetheless. For example, uh, our belief that our senses are generally reliable. Um, that's something that you cannot demonstrate without assuming it's true from the outset. The fact that we all believe we're awake now and not dreaming, right? That's something we take for granted, although we've all had very vivid dreams and we were sure it was real when that lion was chasing us through the Colosseum or whatever nightmare we call it. Um, but we we take this for granted, it's a faith commitment. So is our belief that nature is uniform, that the laws of nature will continue to hold in the future as they have in the past. That's a scandal in philosophy. It's widely recognized that that can't be proven. And then there's the law of causality that scientists and everybody else have to assume that, that every effect has a cause. That's foundational to science and all of human life. That's a faith commitment. And then finally, there's the belief that other people have minds. The other minds problem is another uh, unsolved problem in the history of philosophy, the history of uh, scholarship. If you think you can solve it, I guarantee you, I'll make you world famous and probably you'll win a, 
a prize. Uh, we all experience people's physical bodies, but we can't get inside their heads. We don't experience their thoughts and beliefs uh, directly. So we have to take this for granted. That's a faith assumption. So we have many articles of faith, including uh, the atheists. Thank you.
The points that I raised are problems, at least he acknowledges that, but he is confident that one day they'll be solved, these questions will be answered regarding the origin of the cosmos, the fine-tuning, the origin of life, the emergence of consciousness and morality, they'll eventually be made sense of. <coughs> Notice that every one of those uh, questions, every one of those problems is by its nature beyond the reach of science. Um, maybe I should give him uh, uh, the benefit of the doubt on that regarding the emergence of life just because that is, it sounds like just an odds thing, but maybe not. 10 to the 40,000 to 1 uh, is a far larger number, a smaller chance than what statisticians generally consider to be the cutoff point between what is improbable and what is impossible. And that cutoff point is 10 to the 50th to 1. 10 to the 40,000th to 1, a bit smaller odds there. Why does God help? How does appealing to God as a causal explanation help? Because God is a causal explanation. <clears throat> what we have here is a being that is capable of making a universe, fine-tuning it, bringing all the laws of nature into line for the possibility of life, and being able to start life and create consciousness. I noted at the beginning that John would probably not <coughs> offer an alternative explanation, and he has not. Um, it's simply uh, recognition that these are problems, which they are, and then in some cases he says, let's wait, maybe science will explain these things, but again, the, the Big Bang singularity is by definition beyond the reach of science. It's something that could be explained naturalistically. Uh, the same goes with uh, consciousness, and especially morality, uh, because science does not deal in norms <coughs> or obligations. Now I want to continue to build my case by noting uh, one more important evidence for God, and that is personal experience. Um, in fact, most people, when you ask them, why do you believe in God, why do you have a religious point of view, one of the first things they're going to mention is, uh, you know, their personal experience of God. <clears throat> now this could seem trite to some, uh, but there are some really rigorously worked out defenses of the epistemology of religious perception, in particular by uh, William Alston, who wrote a, what's now a classic recent text in uh, religious epistemology on perceiving God in, in the early 90s. And what Loftus does is he notes these re remarkable parallels between sensory perception and religious perception, or noumenal perception. In sensory perception, no, there are these five features. Our perception of a physical object demands that certain conditions be met by the perceiver, right? We have to be conscious, we have to have a sensory apparatus. Two, perception is about or directed to the object perceived. Three, perception has a public and private aspect, right? I experience that exit sign from here, it's a public fact, but nobody else in the universe is experiencing it exactly like I am from this point of view. Fourthly, perception admits of a part-whole distinction. I genuinely experience that exit sign, even though I'm seeing just a small part of that object. And finally, there are public checks and tests for veridical or trustworthy perception. The same is true of religious perception. Conditions have to be met on the part of the spiritual or noumenal uh, perceiver. Perception is about or directed to the object, God. Perception has a public and private aspect, right? Um, that God is a public object, as it were, but nobody experiences God from exactly my point of view except me. And perception admits a part whole distinction, the perception of God. Uh, just like with sensory perception, I can experience, you might say, an aspect of God, but no one can experience the whole of God. And finally, there are public checks or tests for veridical perception in that we can consult other perceivers of God and compare uh, our experiences. I will add this, <coughs> that the most renowned work uh, when it comes to the scholarship on religious experience was written by William James a little over 100 years ago. It's called The Varieties of Religious Experience. Uh, James was not someone who himself was a religious believer, but after his uh, extensive years-long study and then his <coughs> presentation of the Gifford Lectures that were turned into the book, he came to firmly believe in the supernatural. That is as good uh, an objective study 
of religious experiences has ever been made, and James was convinced. Thank you. And see what you get. What I got 
was that religious faith is unreasonable. Concluding points, and this is important that I remind everybody. Begin thinking of the question you want to ask one of our speakers, because pretty soon you'll be able to put those on a three by five card, and it may get answered. Thank okay. you very much. So this is my closing statement. This is your. You have five minutes for a closing statement. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so John has demonstrated his strong commitment to the laws of nature. I should note that um, the, <laughs> there are different views on what natural laws are, and um, one of them is just the regularity theory, which doesn't affirm that there's any necessity in the laws of nature. So that doesn't back him up. And then there is there is the necessitarian view. Uh, which seems to be what he's affirming, but that very view was debunked by David Hume about 250 years ago when he demonstrated that there is no way to know that there is a necessary connection between causes and effects. And so this is why it's generally uh, agreed among philosophers of science that, you know, it, it's an enigma, the laws of nature. It, we really do have to take them for granted. They can't be demonstrated evidentially or otherwise. When it comes to miracles, uh, as a naturalist, of course, John doesn't have any category for miracles uh, ontologically. It only makes sense if, if one is a theist. But still, it, it, it really uh, behooves us as rational people um, to be open to the possibility that there could be exceptions to the laws of nature that are divinely caused, especially since we know that there is no necessary connection between causes and effects that can be demonstrated. Uh, the laws of nature, again, at best are regularities. <clears throat> so what about the evidence for miracles? I recommend to you uh, C.S. Lewis's classic work on miracles, and the, the more recent work, a two-volume work published by Baker of Books by uh, Craig Keener called uh, Miracles. Two volume, about 1,500 pages long, which uh, itemizes literally hundreds of well-documented, corroborated, often by scientific experts, medical doctors and so on, miracles from all over the world and five different continents. It's fascinating. It's a scholarly work, and yet it's a page turner. <clears throat> Maybe that shouldn't be surprising. All good scholarly works are page turners. So I'm going to conclude just by noting that, again, there are many powerful evidences for God. As I noted, the origin of the cosmos, cosmic fine-tuning, origin of life, emergence of consciousness, morality, and personal experience. John has yet to offer an alternative explanation for any of these things. Secondly, all people have faith. These really are faith commitments. Uh, the philosophical li literature makes it clear regarding the uniformity of nature, causality, other minds, and so on. If John has a solution to those problems to show that they can be demonstrated rationally, again, he'll become a famous, a world-famous scholar. He'll be the first to demonstrate those things. Uh, and then finally, uh, appeals to science for this reason do not undermine religious commitment. In fact, science is based upon presuppositions that only make sense given theism, because only God can make sense of the uniformity of nature. Right? Only God can, um, to, can uh, give us an orderly cosmos where we can expect the future to resemble the past. If you have any uh, doubts or you struggle personally with believing in God, I would recommend that you, in the words of the scholar Tim Lawson, pray to the God who might be there. He wrote a, an excellent article several years ago called, I'm Praying Not to Be an Atheist. If God really is there and he rewards those who seek him, even if you find it difficult to believe, pray to the, the God who might be there. Another devotional exper uh, experiment along these lines is offered by Jesus himself in John 7. He says, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. That is an offer to follow uh, at least 
the, the guidelines and the teachings of Christ and see if he doesn't open your mind and alert you to, in fact, his reality. It also is captured, I think, in the psalmist's remarks. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And then finally, even if you don't want to do those things, you're not interested in any devotional ex experiments or doing any seeking, at least study Jesus Christ as a philosopher. Um, even if he wasn't the Messiah, the, the true Son of God, even if he didn't do any of those miracles that are recorded in Scripture, he's at least one of the greatest thinkers and teachers the world has ever seen. So if you study Kant and Hume and Nietzsche and other lesser lights, include Jesus in your study as the world's greatest philosopher. And I mean that in the literal sense of the term, philosopher, lover of wisdom. Thank you. Uh, 
a two-volume book by Michael Kinger, who says in his book, I'm just going to report what, I, what people tell me. That's what he says in his book. I'm just going to go around and collect these stories. I'm not, not really doing a whole lot of investigation into it. I'm just going to collect and report any miracle stories that I hear. That's not doing research. The same kind of thing that Jim did in his book, Making of an Atheist. The Bible says atheists are bad people, so he, went, he didn't do the proper research into examining whether or not atheists are bad people. The Bible says atheists are bad people, so atheists are bad people, and he used anecdotal evidence throughout his book to prove that. That's not what, that's called special plea. That's the kind of thing I'm against. And he mentioned Jesus as the best philosopher. Listen to this. Read the Gospels as if you were on the uh, other side of his debates. In, in the Gospels, Jesus always wins every debate. I have never seen a debate like that. Not once in my entire life. Where someone has the final word and everybody else is in silence. Because there's so many different ways to interpret things and there's so many different uh, eyes and, 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 and things to define that. Jesus always wins debate. What you need to do when you read the Gospels, if he's such a great philosopher, is ask yourself, what would these people have said in response? Because it's not said. So thank you so much.
Okay, so, set my timer here. Uh, someone asked, if all things that exist have a cause, then what caused God? Now this is a question that's often asked by Richard Dawkins rhetorically to make the point. Um, so what caused God? Nothing caused God. He's a self-existent being. Um, if it sounds like a cop-out, just remember that the naturalist has to say the same thing about matter. And so the point here is that we have two choices. Um, ultimately, either matter exists and is the cause and the source of everything else, or God, a mind, let's just say a mind exists and is the cause of everything else. Those are your two choices. So the question is, which has the most explanatory power, given all the things that I mentioned in terms of the origin of the cosmos, cosmo, cosmic fine-tuning, emergence of consciousness, emergence of life, morality, and personal religious experiences. Matter is the ultimate reality. Can't ultimately explain any of those. But mind is the ultimate reality, very readily explains all of those. Um, the reality of God explains the existence of the material world and everything else. I might have time to address the second question. <clears throat> Did Jesus really exist? Prove it. No. I think um, Jesus might be the most well-attested historical figure in the history of our world. Um, he, he cut history in half. The world dating systems in terms of this guy. Um, there were, of course, many witnesses to his life including many witnesses to his resurrection, um, witnesses like James and John and Paul and Peter. This was a uh, requirement in order to be an apostle of the early church. He had to be an eyewitness of the risen Christ. So not only is his existence the most well-attested fact in the history of the world, but also his resurrection is well-attested through eyewitness accounts. Yeah, about the God uh, as the uh, best explanation. I mean, uh, I don't know um, how many of you have uh, read about evolution, but um, it, uh, it was a brilliant discovery and it's been uh, the consensus of scientists ever since, pretty, pretty much. I mean, it had some, had some convincing to do. It explained um, how we've adapted from a common ancestor, brilliant. And it, so it's not really too hard to, to think that, well, maybe that explains uh, a lot, and maybe if we trust science to, to continue explaining, we can figure out where the universe came, where matter came from, and if not, what better is there? I mean, to, to, to posit a God's existence, you know, and to say, well, this has a good explanatory power, well, what else has it ever explained? I mean, I, I don't know that um, it can explain anything, really, except whatever you want to explain, whatever you need to explain. Uh, so I don't, uh, I don't see how that, uh, you know, is a good answer. Um, as far as, um, I'm, I'm responding, I'm not answering my question yet. And as far as Jesus goes, uh, everything he said is out of the Bible. I, I mean, you know, everything he said was was claimed by somebody. Where's the evidence for it? Really, it's serious. Where's the evidence for it? Um, a lot of different stories and, and things have been made up. Now, I've, I've studied New Testament uh, scholarship uh, quite, quite a bit. I recommend Mark Herman. And, um, you know, these stories and these things, the things that uh, we read in the New Testament, and, and they're just, they're, some of them are just made up. They conflict with one another. Let me give you an example, if I could. In uh, Luke's account of the Gospel, he says, um, I've studied everything so I can uh, relate to you what actually happened. And he, what he does is he doesn't include the, the guards at the tomb story that came from Matthew. He doesn't include that, the guards. They were supposed to be po posted at the tomb to, to make sure that nobody stole the body of Jesus. Luke leaves it out. Wait a minute, Luke just said, I've, I've said everything I couldn't study to, to know what actually happened, and he leaves it out. What's that saying? Except that Luke is, is rejecting Matthew's claim of the Roman guard. True. All right. Um, now, John Locke, can you prove that God did not cause the Big Bang or life to exist on Earth? No. I mean, let's be honest here. I mean, any, uh, anything's possible. I suppose. Now, I, I bet you the God of the Bible didn't do it. Maybe a God of Spirit some kind of might have. I don't see how the mechanism. I just don't see how, if this is a spirit and this is matter, I mean, by definition, how do they actually make contact? 
I mean, we're not talking about energy here. We're not talking about air. We're talking about some spirit thing. How, how does a spirit make contact with matter? I, I don't understand you know, how that would do. That's why I don't understand how I can have a mind. Well, where is a mind? Well, that's, well, 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 why can't you hold it out here if it's not part of the brain? You know, I mean, where is it? Why, how can it actually move neurons in your brain if it's not connected? So, uh, no, I can't, I can't prove it's false. Um, but um, I don't see any reason to expect it, except that, um, that um, uh, there's a reason uh, for it uh, having done, uh, having God having created uh, that. Okay. Right. So, I was going to do two questions, too, but. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, um, no. Okay. <laughs> I should. Yeah, you should. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, if, if the brain has been proved to obtain a defensive mechanism to new and contradictory, then how can one be sure that they aren't open to the possibility of miracles? I, I, I read it fairly well. Um, if the brain lies to us, how can you, how can you, uh, why aren't you open to the possibility of miracles? I already answered that. I am. I just don't, I, I demand clinical evidence in trial. I, clinical trials are the best ways to know whether something works, not anecdotal evidence. Do you have a minute to follow up on that before I consider some other questions? Well, uh, in terms of evidence uh, regarding, um, uh, you know, there being a supernatural uh, aspect to us that goes beyond our brain, I didn't mention this uh, in my earlier remarks, but this is such a massive topic, and that's the, the subject of near-death experiences. Uh, there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people um, around the globe who have had near-death experiences where their heart stopped beating, and in many cases there's a, a demonstrated flat EEG, there's no brain activity. And during that time when they are down, they have certain experiences uh, about the things in their immediate uh, environment, say if they're in a, a, a surgery uh, room, or uh, their house, or wherever that uh, are later corroborated by other people. For example, <clears throat> someone who died while she was in surgery and looked down <clears throat> and watched for several minutes the procedure they were doing on her, and then um, her soul returned to her body, and after the surgery, she was able to report accurately to the uh, surgeon exactly what he had done during the surgery. He was blown away by this. That's just one example. There are also uh, cases of people who are blind having visual experiences. Uh, you've got other forms of corroboration in terms of people they contacted on the other side uh, and then uh, confirmed uh, claims that they make related to that. It's a, it's a massive uh, field of study. I'm going past my minute there. The near-death experience. So uh, someone has asked, <clears throat> what kind of religious upbringing do you, did you experience as a child? I was not uh, raised in a, in a devoutly Christian or evangelical home. My mother was a, a Christian, my father was more agnostic, and um, they certainly had strong Judeo-Christian values, and I was raised with that understanding, you don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't steal, but I, did, I was not inculcated uh, with religious beliefs. Um, I uh, came to Christ, became a Christian, as a young man as a result of a number of really fascinating experiences that, to my mind, confirm all the things that I've been sharing with you regarding the reality of God, the reality of Christ. Uh, but that was not my upbringing. Um, so, um, got another little bit of time here. Back about the near-death experience thing, I wanted to add this, that uh, if any one of those near-death experiences is true, any one of those hundreds of thousands or millions of such cases reported uh, by sometimes authors like Evan Alexander, John Burke, and uh, Howard Storm, who had a very negative, hellish experience and converted as a uh, result of that, if any one of those is true and veridical, that shows that uh, we are not just physical entities. There's something more to us than matter. That there's some supernatural aspect that is real. <clears throat> and that explains how you can have thinking and perception without a brain function in the midst of these near-death experiences. It's a powerful category uh, of evidence for the reality of the supernatural.
not just sure if I'm supposed to respond or not. I'm, I'm just going to go on to the next question, so we won't be able to answer everything. Uh, can you further explain your dismissal of Hume? What do you offer in place of his empiricism? Now, there's a philosopher there. Um, I don't, I don't dismiss Hume, not at all. Uh, he's one of my heroes. Some have called David Hume as the greatest English-speaking philosopher um, you know, that we know. So I'm not dismissing him. I'm, I'm uh, dismissing uh, how he's being used by Christian philosophers. Uh, and uh, Hume, for instance, said, was, he's, he brought on the death of certainty. After Hume, um, people had to rethink life. Immanuel Kant, for instance, says uh, Hume woke him up from his dogmatic slumbers. Um, uh, because Hume was an empiricist. Things, uh, uh, there's, you know, as an empiricist, he, he had to have evidence for everything. And you know, I do, you know. But he 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 was looking for certainty. Can I find a foundation for knowledge based in mere in the sense data that we experience? And uh, so he examined God, the self causality and miracles, and um, these four categories he wrote extensively about, and he said, you know what, I can't believe that there's a God because there's no, I can't, I can't be certain there's a God because there's no, I heard about this, that, I cannot even be certain I have a self, there's a self inside my head or a self inside your head because I don't have any empirical sense, and he called the brain a bundle of sensations, right Jim? So, um, and he said, I can't, I can't even see causality. And he used an example, example of a billiard ball going across the pool table. Well, I love pool, but I want to lay out five bucks afterwards. Um, and um, so uh, you can't, you don't actually see a billiard ball hitting uh, a ball on the pool table. What you see is the cue ball going here, and it's stopping, you hear a sound, and then you hear another ball move. You don't actually see cause and effect. You can't see cause and effect. So he said, you know, simply that, you can't see cause and effect. Um, and then he says, uh, uh, you can't, you know, use no empirical evidence of miracles either. And he used the fact of natural law, since we have natural laws for things, that natural law itself rules out uh, the breaking uh, of that, he called it violation of nature. So, no, I, I, I think that um, Hume is brilliant. He changed how we think about things. It's just that when you say that, um, uh, you say that, um, uh, that I'm the, um, that Hume dis destroys my view. Uh, Hume was looking for certainty. I'm not looking for certainty. Certainty died with Hume. And so I'm just saying that Hume showed an overwhelming preponderance, preponderance an overwhelming um, a sense of which that um, you know, nature is uniform. You know, and that's it. You don't have to prove certainty. Because once you say, well, you know, there's nothing but science, there's nothing but evidence, there's nothing but this, nothing but that, then someone's able to say, well, you know, you're nothing but her. <laughs> and that's being, that's having faith. And I don't I embrace faith. Okay, my one minute response to that <clears throat> um, actually uh, addresses a question that was put to me about the error in cause and effect, you know, that science is based on the principle of causality. Um, <clears throat> I stand by Hume as well, insofar as what he found. There's a little misstatement there in what John said. Uh, he, Hume did not de deny the relation of cause and effect. What he denied is that we can establish any necessary connection between causes and effects. We don't get it from experience. We don't get it from reason alone. This is what prompted Kant to wake up from his dogmatic slumbers and propose a whole transcendental uh, epistemology where he proposed that the human mind is downloaded, as it were, or pre-fashioned with certain innate categories of understanding. Among them is this relation of cause and effect. So we, we don't know any necessary connection between cause and effect. We take it for granted. That's the article of faith, one of many, that is uh, at the foundation of the scientific method. Now, this is a question that was put to me. Um, two minutes. Uh, what would it take for you, that is me, to change your mind about belief in God? And I have to confess that I would say, really, at this point, nothing could do that. And here's why. 
because so long as anything contingent exists, uh, so long as anything at all exists, there has to be some ultimate cause and source of that reality and ultimately a, a being that is self-existent. So if anything exists, then something self-existent exists, God, let's call it, something does exist, so God exists. Now, uh, if you were to follow up, someone did last night, what would it take to get you to give up Christianity or belief in Jesus? There I can conceive of some things. If it was discovered that, in fact, uh, the bones of Jesus uh, were uh, demonstrably existed, that his body could be produced, or the remnants of that, that would prove that he didn't rise from the dead. Okay, I'd change my mind. Maybe I'd revert to some sort of generic theism, or maybe I'd opt for some other uh, theistic religious tradition. Or, if some evidence came along that utterly undermined the reliability of the New Testament, which, by the way, the New Testament uh, <clears throat> satisfies all three of the major tests for historical reliability, the internal test, the external test, and the bibliographical test, uh, which require that a document to be historically reliable. Um, uh, it has to affirm that um, it's attested to by eyewitnesses. The external test is their external um, archaeological evidence that confirms it. The bibliographical test uh, has to do with how early the manuscript copies are. And the New Testament exceeds all other ancient documents in terms of manuscript attestation, thousands of manuscripts dating back to within the first three or four hundred years of the close of the New Testament.
What kind of up religious upbringing did you, uh, you know, have a time? I'll cover those later. Yeah, <clears throat> as far as my one minute response, <clears throat> um, John noted what his uh, uh, moral commitments or principles are. That has to do with a, a question that was posed to me about um, why you know, uh, non-religious or atheistic people can do good. Um, two things I would note about that, uh, how uh, atheists, naturalists, those who don't believe in God um, are often very virtuous. Um, I would appeal to <coughs> a couple of things. One um, is uh, the uh, census divinitatis, the, or the natural law, the, the law of um, <coughs> nature that is within um, a person, our conscience, the law of God written on our hearts, as it were. There's lots of different ways to, uh, <coughs> to put that. I think John appeals to certain principles or values that are in sync with the Judeo-Christian ethic. It's uh, a, a very natural response to his being made in the image of God. And many atheists, naturalists, agnostics are very, very responsive to that and lived very uh, good lives. So that's not surprising from a theistic point of view. Uh, a question that's put to me <clears throat> is, if there is a God, why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? Amazing we've gotten this far in the discussion without talking about um, the problem of evil. I have a couple things to say to that. One. Uh, a naturalistic worldview cannot even make sense of evil. Judgments of right and wrong and good and evil presuppose a transcendent st uh, standard for goodness, as I noted in my moral argument. <coughs> but the naturalist cannot provide that, cannot explain the norms and thoughts that are required to make judgments about evil. As for solving the problem of evil, there are many promising theodicies. I think the ones that I find uh, most interesting and useful are the free will defense and the greater good theodicy. Um, most Christian philosophers today are partial to the free will defense, but the greater good theodicy, which uh, argues that God permitted evil and suffering so that um, we can grow in, in virtues and, and develop uh, better characters, um, <clears throat> that one has... Uh, a lot of biblical recommendation in passages like James 1 um, and 1 Peter 1 and elsewhere, which note that um, we grow in, in, our, uh, in, in terms of moral maturity and virtue through our struggle with suffering. <clears throat> Thirdly, in connection with that, there's the promise of an afterlife where all wrongs will be righted, all virtues rewarded, and all evils punished. As we are in a just universe or just reality. God will make all things right in terms of rewards and punishments. And then finally, I would say that the Christian worldview in particular offers a God who suffers with us and who will ultimately redeem um, all of this. And he did this redemption through the worst of all suffering, which was the suffering of Christ. And if he thought it worthwhile to go through it himself, then uh, we can trust that somehow it will all be worthwhile, the pain and suffering that we have to go through um, in this order of being. I was looking through my notes last night, you said that uh, God uh, uses, I assume you said this today, God uh, uses pain to, you know, mold our souls uh, or help us be better people. Well, if that's the case, then why does he bring more? More of it, more, I want to see it's more of it, you know? If that's how you have to do it bit, to make good people, then we need more. I mean, apparently, that's what it is. But um, evil is suffering. That's what an atheist knows. It's suffering. It's ubiquitous suffering. It's suffering that is intense. Uh, it's the law of um, uh, uh, the nature's law of, of red, red tooth and claw. You know, uh, right now, creatures are eating each other to stay alive. And of course, we do as well when we eat uh, meat. <coughs> Um, so uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of pain and suffering, uh, you know, molesting, uh, you know, uh, people are getting beat up, and killed, and robbed, and stole. Um, that's suffering. I empathize with them because I don't want that to happen to me or anybody I love. So I, I try to do what I can to alleviate suffering. And when I say I'm happy, I mean he, like, he makes me happy. It makes me happy to know that I make a difference in the world. 
and, uh, and I do that as well. So, um, questions um, here. Um, when you talk about truth, here's one Jim would like to respond to, I'm pretty sure. What is truth? How can there uh, be truth if there is no God that defines the one truth and what is underlying? So, if there's somebody who thinks there's one truth and um, uh, that God, is, God defines that, you know, I mean, that put it in the hands of a Hindu. Put it in the hands of, a, of an ISIS member. Um, put it in the hands of a, you know, a Catholic or lesser priest or one who uh, covers up that sort of stuff. Well, one of the many um, uh, Protestant ministers that have been caught red-handed with financial difficulties or, or uh, of sexual problems. Well, yeah, no, I'm not going to put it in the hands of anybody because you never hear God speak. It's always someone who claims to have heard God speak. Even a Bible cell, Moses comes down supposedly. I don't think that happened, of course. And uh, um, he says, "I heard God." You never, you know, you never hear you know that kind of story. You never, you never see, you never see God speaking. You always hear somebody else. I'm sorry, I'm tired of that. I'm not going to listen to what you say God said. So when I talk about truth, there's different theories, correspondence. Um, there's a coherence. There's pragmatic. Um, it, it's 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 as best as possible. Uh, what actually has occurred as best as possible what actually exists and you always think of probabilities that's why I'm not you know um, you know that, that's where you can't use Hugh against me because he was talking about certainty I'm talking about probability where it looks like from all that you can tell from all the evidence you have that this is this is what happened or this is the case knowing in advance you have to think of exclusively in terms of probabilities and not based and when you do that you might have to admit you might be wrong but if you're going by the probabilities, that's all you can go by. Thank you. Yep. Is this the last one? Yeah. <coughs> you reply. You get to respond. Just to reply. Just to reply. Yeah. We're <coughs> done. Okay. Um, well, then, I'm going to use my minute to do this. I'm going to read something, and then I will... Uh, know what question I'm responding to. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by, man, by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Who's that about, John? It's about Israel. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 3. Good. Well, no, it's Isaiah 53, but you're close. No, 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 no. That's the, that's, that explains who it is. Isaiah 49, 3. So that is a messianic prophecy that is probably as good a description or a review or summary of the doctrine of atonement, better than anything you're going to find in the New Testament. And yet that was written 700 years before Christ was even born. So someone uh, had asked this question by reading that was a response to this question. Do you have any favorite Old Testament prophecies that were directly fulfilled by Christ? And that is it. Of course it did serve a double function. Many of the prophecies did. That included. But that's pretty dramatic stuff. Thank you. Wow. That, that's awesome. We are... Uh... This concludes this portion of the meeting. It's been wonderful being here. Is this on? It was wonderful being here with you folks. Hi. <laughs> Christopher Rex wants to uh, close it out, so thank you very much. All right, I just want to make sure that we give a special thanks to all of our debaters who were kind enough to come tonight, uh, Dr. Jim Spiegel, as well as John Loftus, and of course our wonderful moderator, uh, Roger McNett. Also want to thank the Allen County Public Library for hosting us tonight, uh, as well as their support staff to help us with some of the um, setting up of lights and uh, other technology issues.
Uh, I do want to wish you at this time uh, to take a moment as you exit. Uh, the debaters will be out by their respective tables selling their books, so you can certainly ask them uh, about those products and maybe even purchase and be gracious enough to sign said products as you do so. Uh, also, some of you received, hopefully most of you received, a survey, a series of survey questions as you entered. So it would be very helpful for us if you could take a moment to fill out that survey, um, as well as hand it in at the Free Thought Fort Wayne table as you exit as well. Uh, so please help yourself to materials that are on display at your table while you're there. Um, and you know what? If you would like to be added to our mailing list, which we have a monthly newsletter and such, please be sure to sign up on your way out as well. Thank you for coming tonight, and please thank our speakers.